we will build on the um, presentation from Sarah and we will focus on the novel and innovative technologies being developed within the three projects in the areas of sensors, real-time monitoring, communication systems, modeling and analytics from a technical point of view presented by researchers and developers within each project. Uh, don't forget to please submit your questions through the Q&A and uh, if time permits after each project presentation we may be able to answer one or two questions in real time. If not then we will provide answers through the Q&A. So the first to present is the impact project and we will start off with Corrado Di Natale from UNITOV in Rome and Brendan O'Flynn from the Tyndall Institute in Cork. It's all yours, Corrado. Yes, good morning. Um, yes, my presentation is coming, okay. Good morning, thanks for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, uh, the next slide, please. Okay. Uh, well, the success of information systems uh, is based on the quality and quantity of sensors data. So impact project has been mainly based on commercial out of the shelf sensors. However, some parameters are not satisfactorily detected in particular in long time unattended on site deployments. So to expand the amount of sensorial data in impact project, the development of novel sensors has been pursued. And I will introduce now a couple of examples of sensors platforms developed in this project. The next, please. The first one is a platform for chemical analysis developed at the University of Rome, Tor Vergata. So we know that chemical assays are re reliable, relatively simple methods of analysis. And there's a number of well-established procedures based on reaction where the quantification of a target analyte is accomplished by the measurement of reaction products. Assays require a precise manipulation of reagents and reliable detection of reaction products. Here, a microfluidic chips have been engineered to standardize the measurement, to increase the reproducibility, to optimize the consumption of reagents and the production of wastes, to minimize the environmental impact then, and finally, to measure analytes on site. So sensors, uh, by uh, either optical or electrochemicals, have been embedded in the microfluidic circuit and all the function of pumps, valves and sensors in data analysis are supervised by a microcontroller. This platform communicates with data acquisition systems and which enables the integration of data with other sensors. The next please. Here are a couple of examples of the use of the platform for nitrides and phosphates detection is uh, illustrated. So the detection of nitrites is based on colorimetric grease reactions. The reagents are mixed together with a sample. Color changes are recorded by a LED as a light source and an RGB color sensor. In figure, we see the reconstructed color from the RGB sensor data at different nitrites concentration. Calibration curves is dominated by red and green colors, which are both sensitive to the reaction and thus the concentration of nitrites. Phosphate detection are implement, implements the reaction with oxomolybdenate. And the reaction product in this case is an electroactive compound that is reduced at the electrode and the volt amperometric readout enables uh, for the estimate of phosphate a concentration down to micromolars. Next, please. <clears throat> and uh, uh, the, the second plat platform is a multi-sensor platform attachable to MTA species. And this has been developed by, by Tyndall. A first prototype has been de designed to control seaweed. The platform embeds physical sensor, temperature, light and depth, and an inertial motion unit. In situ data can be compared with large scale data recorded by conventional sensors in order to provide a map of parameters inside the biomass to optimize the growth condition of species. Next steps will include the chemical sensors in this uh, platform. The next please. <clears throat> Here a picture of the device uh, is visible and its internal architecture too. The platform is based on microcontroller unit which control and manages all the activity of the system and also the transmission of the, the data. The data can be either collected offline via a USB connection or in real time with a near field communication protocol based 
on a communication at 13.5 megahertz. At this frequency, water attenuation is quite limited and underwater wireless communication is made possible. The whole system is battery powered, circuits designed for low power mode. Of course, a uh, uh, waterproof enclosure has been uh, de de designed for underwater operation. In the figure here, we see the accelerometer test in a simple damped pendulum setup, the data of the accelerometer, the uh, red one, are compared with the, with the data from an optical motion capture system in a damped pendulum uh, experiment. So the data of the accelerometer are, let's say, quite stable and, and accurate. So this was a quick introduction to the features and capability of the developed the sensor pl platform, what we have done in the input project. And I thank you for the kind of att attention. <clears throat> Hi, good morning. Okay, this is Sergio Martinez from Lightcat, and I plan to, to introduce you a brief uh, some of the uh, equipments that are developed in the Play More Impact project. So, next, please. Okay, uh, nowadays uh, we have a lot of sensors already in field, like the colleague Corrado and Sarah explained it in the presentation before, but there is, but there is still some, some issues that need to be fixed. Okay, and there are sensors that, for instance, the ones from Corrado at the beginning of the project that are manually operated, okay, without communication or without automation. Okay, um, nowadays there is a, a problem that the, the manufacturers offer the old solution and there is a, a, a not a standardized or a, a single access point. The, the, each manufacturer is providing the old connectivity solution. Uh, as well, there are some problems with the, with the data issues um, in, the, in terms that the manufacturer offers only solutions that they want to offer. And, Sometimes there are limited access to, to data or to data samples or data frequency. And, uh, and there are, um, uh, as a conclusion, there is still uh, some parameters that are far to be digitalized or to be uh, on a digital world. In impact, we'll, the things that we are working is to provide a, a platform composed by different elements that I want to introduce you now that in order to automate this kind of measurements for new sensors like the one from Colorado, but as well for commercial ones like the ones explained by, by Sarah. Okay, next. Okay, the first device is a uh, dynamic energy management system. It's developed by on parallel in, in the framework of impact. It's a device that comes to, to interconnect sensors to, to power as, as well the different devices that are within field in terms of uh, tech energy. From, from solar panels or from wind generators and to uh, provide power to the to sensors and, and equipment. Uh, this is a smart unit in terms that uh, have a different power, power output, it's fully programmable, programmable via serial commands. It provides uh, its own connectivity, provides uh, real-time statistics about the energy generation, about the energy consumption, and it's, and it's uh, um, and it is working as well, fully fully deployable at the environment using waterproofing cases. The next, please. Okay, the second the second intent that I want to, to show you is the Ayadas. The Ayadas is a is a smart unit that claims to handle with the sensor connectivity. One one issue that we are really faced is that the sensor has some connectivity. It means that you need to have different connectivity access points for for each sensor. So the one that we plan to provide here is a unit that is able to have different sensors. So uh, it integrates the the APIs, the commands to interact with different sensors, commercial and new ones, like the one from from Corrado. It as well has a an SD card that, that is configurable in order to determine uh, which sample frequencies you have for each sensor, in order to configure which sensors do you already have on board. So you can configure uh, where the sensor is plugged, 
and what is the sample frequency for the sensor. Uh, as well, you have data logger capabilities. You have as well small algorithms in order to filter the data, but as well to change the sample frequency is something is, re is required by the group platform, but as well, if something is detected in order to uh, determine it, it is a wrong data, or it's uh, an, a normal behavior that you need to report, and it's implemented into different configurations. Um, USB, a wired configuration for the ones that we already have a direct connection with um, the gateway to, to report the data, or for a very large environment where we need to uh, deploy more than one, or we need to cover a wet area, we have a, a LoRa link that allow us to connect with the gateway with a, LoRa, with a wireless interface. Uh, finally, it implements uh, two links, one app link to send data to the to the gateway and other link to receive data from the cloud platform in order to modify the behavior of the company itself. Next. And, and the last and, and the last element that we want to, to show you is the one that we showed us, the data aggregator system. This is a gateway that collects data from all the from the different sensors, from the different IADAs, and as well for the energy management system in Frecaret. Okay, it collects data from the different devices that are really on field and provide connectivity uh, using uh, technica, techniques like uh, 4G, 5G, or satellite. Okay. Uh, it, it, mainly, it mainly has as well uh, some intelligence inside in order to allow us to keep the data in, in order to avoid losses if something fails, if there are connectivity issues, or simple, there is not, uh, in, there, is, there is a limited amount of energy available in order to, to, keep the, to keep the data. So it implements data logger, it implements as well different MQTT uh, files in order to uh, address the data to the proper uh, access point on the cloud platform. It's as well low power in order to, to allow operation with solar panels. And finally, it's as well protected to be operated on the water and on a, on a water level. So finally, in the, in the chart, you can see what exactly we have. We have the energy management system which feeding uh, its power in the different devices. And we have the IADAS that is uh, collecting, managing the different sensors. And finally, the, all this data is uh, reported to the DAS using a LoRa or USB connection in order to, to, trans, to transport data to the, to the cloud platform. Okay. Uh, good uh, morning, my name is Miroslav Daretsky. I'm from the Institute of Oceanology in Sopot, Poland, and I would like to tell you a few words about potential of using the satellite data in the monitoring of the aquacultures. Next, please. So far at our session, only sensors which are immersed in the water have been present, but many essential environmental variables can be measured also from a far distance from sensors mounted on the satellites. Such sensors can provide us information about the whole investigated area. Next slide, please. Almost at the same time, we can retrieve the information related to the whole basin, even to the whole globe. Uh, next slide, please. But thanks to the increased spatial resolution of the modern sensors, we can investigate also small details. We can even spot a physical structure of the aquaculture. See picture on the right. Next slide. But satellite remote sensing is not about nice images. We do measure the spectral shape of the light emerging from the water. We call it the ocean color. And we already know that it can vary significantly, like on the figure on the left. We also know that the ocean color depends on the constituents of the marine water, e.g. phytoplankton, which can consist of various pigments absorbing the light in different spectral regions, depending on the type, ambient light conditions, and many other factors. But what is most important that based on the analysis of the spectral features of the light emerging from the water, we are able to 
retrieve information about some constituents in the water and water properties like phytoplankton abundance, phytoplankton types, but it can also be concentration of suspended matter, water transparency, and many, many others. Next slide, please. In practice, to get a map of a specific parameter from a satellite image, we need two steps. The first, we call the atmospheric correction, because measured signal before reaching the satellite sensor is strongly affected by absorbing and scattering in the atmosphere. What should be taken into account? And after the cleaning our signal, we could apply the specific algorithms, utilizing the spectral dependency between the light emerging from the water and desired water constituents. And as a result, we have the map of the coffee concentration on the right image. And next, and summarizing some advantages of the satellite data, they're acquired regularly. Usually it depends on the sensor re resolution twice or daily or every few days when we take into account 10 meters resolution. The clouds are only the limitation in acquiring new data. And they provide a great potential for investigation, not only spatial, but also temporal variability, as well as in impending trace like half algae and blooms. On the left the side, we have some example of the mini websites developed in the impact project by Argans, where we can see how we can compare, you know, uh, uh, temporal variability at the sun station for different years. So that's a great potential and we just advise to use it. Thank you very much. So good morning. Um, I am Antoine Mangin, working with uh, Argans and Acri in France. Uh, I will show you some example of crowdsourced data. So please, you can uh, next slide, please. Okay. So the idea is to introduce a, a kind of qualitative information, so a means to report for qualitative information by a human, and uh, through um, through the use of a smartphone and tablet. So it provides on top of quantitative measurements, it provides some qualitative information. So for this, we use two types of uh, observers, which has been called the crowd, but it's not really a crowd. One is um, a set of people, professional and scientists, and that will report from the farm about the environment, the fish health and the production uh, tools, so that is to say the nets, for instance. And also we ask general public to to provide some observations about the, the much larger uh, environment, uh, for instance, for algal bloom and jellyfish. So if you go to the next, please. Okay, so this is very simple. In fact, uh, regularly uh, people on the farm are asked to report on if everything is okay. So this is the basic uh, functioning of the tool. So this is okay, everything is green. So you can validate that everything is green. So now something is getting wrong and then you can report on the type of problems that is occurring here and you validate and you can add a picture so this if you click please okay all this information is uh, stored on the web gis and can be consulted um, on the web gis and then if you click again and all the information are sent to the impact system and uh, are used for decision making through the decision tree uh, system. So that's it for me. Thank you. So uh, hello, everybody. This is Yanni uh, Janetis from uh, Wings and for the impact project. So, uh, can, uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can, yeah. Yes, okay. So, uh, if we go to the first slide, please, I will uh, present uh, the uh, general function of the uh, integrated ma uh, management system uh, of impact and, uh, how, and the different functions that it, uh, that it provides. So, at this, uh, as uh, we have a uh, already mentioned that there is a the data acquisition system uh, which, which includes uh, all the uh, all the data uh, all the data acquisition systems uh, from the field uh, so this is the others and the dash uh, that was mentioned before as well as the crowdsourcing uh, 
and uh, remote sensing uh, data that uh, we collect from a satellite or from uh, mobile phones. So all this data is aggregated into uh, the data management system where it is ingested and distributed and uh, stored in a database. And uh, later on, the data is, all this data and the, uh, the relations between uh, this data uh, is uh, analyzed in order to, to uh, produce uh, automated observations and enhance uh, the decision-making operations of the system. And, uh, and last, uh, the, the, the last part includes the visualization of all this data and of all these uh, automated uh, observations and uh, suggestions to the user uh, in a way that, is, uh, uh, that enhances the operation, the day-to-day the, the -day operations uh, uh, in the in the aquaculture side. So if you go to the next uh, slide, please. Yes. So uh, the uh, our system is has been based on a series of business requirements uh, such as uh, optimal harvest, uh, feeding, uh, 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 the environmental uh, sustainability, uh, and other requirements that have been recorded by uh, by actual users, by actual aquaculture owners. And they have been translated into a series of technical requirements, uh, such as a visualization system, a decision support system, uh, a series of uh, uh, an uh, analysis functionalities, uh, in order to produce uh, and enhance, uh, uh, to produce uh, automated the results and enhance uh, the overall uh, experience of the user. So, uh, and, and the other the other view that uh, we can see the system is uh, uh, from a data oriented uh, point where uh, the data is ingested into the system using several technologies, uh, as mentioned. It is analyzed uh, using a series of services uh, that have been developed and uh, are aggregated uh, using a decision support system in order to produce specific day-to-day uh, suggestions and uh, of course are visualized at the end uh, through the dashboard that has been developed. So next slide please. Uh, regarding the data and predictive analytics that have been developed in the system and that uh, are uh, executed in the background, we have developed uh, a series of uh, water analytics such as predictions, uh, parameter estimations and statistical analysis of the collected parameters as well as a biomass growth forecasting uh, using the recorded, the recorded production data in order to uh, predict uh, actual, the, the production growth of the, of the fish using uh, standard models for different species. Next, please. Uh, the other part of the analytics that have been developed uh, includes uh, the camera analytics, uh, which uh, uh, include uh, the disease diagnosis algorithms uh, that uh, are based on uh, ML models and uh, with fusion with uh, environmental data in order to deduce about um, uh, scar uh, identification uh, on, uh, on the fish. Next one. Uh, additionally, the behavioral analysis uh, algorithms are executed in order to identify behavioral traits uh, such as uh, energetic or lethargic behavior, uh, scattering or gathering uh, behaviors, uh, uh, biting of the nets, etc. So uh, these are uh, also automated observations like that are also produced. Next, please. Uh, the biomass estimation uh, part is also, also one very important functionality that we, we provide, and uh, there is also a video here, yes, uh, where uh, the fish are uh, identified here and uh, they are uh, measured in terms of length uh, and uh, we, using the, co the corresponding uh, the, uh, the correlation between the average weight and the average length uh, is detected, we can uh, actually uh, estimate uh, the, the average weight that is, uh, detect that is uh, currently uh, on view of the camera. Next, please. So the decision support system uh, finally is the, the final outcome of the, uh, of the system and it exploits all this data and all these automated observations from the data and predictive analytics to uh, make, uh, to, to visualize all these results in a more user-friendly uh, way to the, to the operator that uses the site. For example, the welfare uh, uh, part exploits all this data, all this, uh, information in order to calculate a series of indexes that are uh, uh, that are calculated based on uh, on expertise advice of course that we have collected and we have uh, identified a series of metrics that can be can provide uh, an overall uh, estimation of all these uh, of all this information uh, next 
So uh, the other, the other, another part is about the optimal and uh, optimal harvest or seeding planning, so where we exploit environmental uh, environmental data uh, in uh, relation with the production data that has been collected in order to evaluate and suggest, uh, based on historical data that has been collected, uh, to suggest the optimal timing of uh, harvest and seeding operations, which is also a very important uh, requirement in day-to-day -day aquaculture. Next one. Okay, so the uh, IMTA production evaluation is one very important concept, concept of our uh, of our project, and uh, what we uh, what we try to do is to compare the different uh, uh, the different uh, species. Uh, uh, the different species proportions uh, in order to uh, uh, not only visualize uh, the current status of the site, but to also um, uh, to also evaluate the, its performance in, in terms of um, uh, remediation of the different uh, substances that uh, the feed or uh, the fish waste uh, produces in order uh, in correspondence to the plant uh, uh, absorb uh, absorption of these uh, substances. Next one. So uh, the last one that we are going to show here is about the uh, optimal feeding, which uh, of course is not. Uh, 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 it's related to uh, not only environmental conditions but also to the camera footage and very, uh, very, uh, which is very important and. Uh, the biomass estimation parts and the behavioral analysis that the uh, data that is collected is all evaluated in order to produce a series of uh, uh, a series of uh, features uh, at the dashboard to calculate the, the optimal feeding amount and uh, also to guide the, the operator during a real time feeding in order to uh, guide the fish as efficiently and as precise as possible. So uh, next one. Okay, so the uh, we'll show this for, with, an, uh, with a quick example. So the data, uh, all these functionalities uh, uh, are based on the environmental data that uh, have been collected and on the camera uh, uh, on the camera footage and also on the satellite uh, or crowdsourcing data. All these are going to the database and they are stored. For example, a temperature or dissolved oxygen. Uh, data as well as a video stream is going to the to the data management system and is uh, forwarded uh, where it is stored. It is forwarded to the uh, data analysis algorithms uh, where the environmental predictors and the behavioral analysis uh, algorithms uh, produce alerts about the oxygen uh, depletion or, uh, and for uh, lethargic behavior, for example. So uh, the decision support system then produces a series of suggestions about how to face these problems and uh, uh, what, uh, what actions to take. And of course, all this is visualized in the dashboard in the corresponding uh, interface. So uh, all this uh, has been uh, has been an example of uh, what the system can do and uh, of course uh, the overall functionality is based on this uh, architecture the data acquisition uh, the management of this data uh, the analysis its analysis the decision making mechanism and finally the visualization and this is how the system uh, uh, overall the system flow uh, works uh, that's me thank you very much yeah. Good morning. I'm Lorian Villemont from Deltaris. I will be presenting about why we need IMTA models and how they these were set up and applied within the impact projects. Next, please. Yeah, as you all know, uh, IMTA has been um, identified as a sustainable solution for the development of um, agriculture, and it has numerous benefits. Uh, including for production, but also for environmental impacts. Next. Um, but these benefits uh, depend on different things. So for example, the farm layouts, uh, the um, different uh, species that are cultivated and also the trophic status of the local ecosystem. So this is where IMTA models come in handy since they allow for the investigation of the benefits, but also the limitations of different setups for specific environments. Next, please. Um, so within IMPACT, we developed two IMTA models for the North Sea and Turkish pilot sites. Um, these IMTA models uh, should include several components. So they should be able to reproduce 3D hydrodynamics and the transport of salt and uh, temperature. 
uh, to be able to accurately represent uh, current velocities and stratification. At, uh, they also need a appropriate resolution to be able to represent dilution and transport processes around the farm. Uh, these should also include relevant water quality processes and the dynamics of cultivated species, but also the feedback effects of these species uh, on the surrounding ecosystem. Um, these models uh, need to be fed with uh, quite a large amount of data with, to represent, for example, the meteorological um, conditions, but also to uh, represent um, the offshore conditions at the boundaries and also uh, the farm layouts. And the uh, results from these models uh, give information on uh, the biomasses of produced species, but also the effects and the intera interactions with the surrounding environments. They do not, uh, such large scale models do not uh, allow for the representation of complex interaction within the farms themselves. Next, please. So uh, I will finish by presenting a couple of results uh, we got for the Turkish pilot sites uh, from Chamli. Uh, this one is located in a very oligo oligotrophic environment uh, in the um, Northern Aegean Sea. And the pilot site uh, tested cultivating ova rigida seaweed and Mediterranean mussels in the vicinity of um, sea bass cages. We carried out a first simulation run uh, without the extra nutrient loads um, from the fish cages and where we simulated the growth of mussels and seaweed in the farm. So on the left uh, picture, you can see the surface total phosphorus concentration um, average for a whole production year. And you can see that these concentrations are quite low over the whole area. And on the right, you can see the um, seaweed and mussel biomass over a whole production year. And what you can see is that the seaweed actually dies off in these conditions and the mussels don't grow. Next, please. Yeah. In a second uh, run, we added, uh, we included this extra nutrient load that um, come from the fish, fish uh, feces and uh, the unused feed. And what you can see is that it um, leads to a sharp increase in total phosphorus and also nitrogen concentration around the farm and in the whole bay area. Um, and you can see that in, in these conditions, uh, the seaweed still dies off, which was also observed on the field. Uh, but it is possible in these conditions with this IMTA setup to uh, produce mussels. So just to conclude, I'll, uh, yeah, we, we believe that once these kind of models are thoroughly validated against the environmental data and data on uh, cultivated species dynamics, uh, these will be very important tools for farmer and regulator support. Thanks. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my talk will uh, be related with sensors and machine learning uh, serving aquaculture product quality. Next, please. Uh, actually, the, the whole system uh, on food uh, uh, evaluation of safety and quality is based on the fact that we are uh, dealing, we are uh, assessed the, the end product, the finished product. And this is, of course, uh, very um, give us a lot of problems. Next, please. Uh, the current tools that are used is sensory analysis, which is an expensive and time consuming, uh, conventional microbiology, uh, uh, the outcome of the results come after two or three days. Uh, then we have uh, the molecular tools. Uh, again, we have uh, quite a few hours to wait for the results. Chemical analysis sometimes are not uh, feasible because we are looking for specific markers and the predictive modeling. Uh, the food industry and the food uh, authorities in general, uh, as well as the consumers, they need to have the uh, outcome uh, in seconds. Next, please. 
So what we are proposing, we are proposing uh, uh, to give a, a product ID and we are using uh, no destructive rapid methods. The outcome of this, uh, um, of this measurement, they are going to a database uh, repository where we have uploaded um, algorithms and the whole process is called process analytical technologies. And in seconds, even in minutes, uh, we have the final outcome. Next one, please. And uh, uh, in fact, we try to combine analytical non-destructive instruments with machine learning. That's the usual plan that we are applying. Uh, in fish and seafood products, we are getting the metabolomics and different fingerprints. We combine that with microbiological analysis. We develop uh, regression models and that provide us information about the quality of uh, fish and the seafood products. Next one, please. Uh, these are the data that we are uh, acquired from all these methodologies that we are using. Uh, it's a, a lot of amount of, uh, of uh, data. And uh, next one, please. And for this reason, we have to, first of all, the original data, we have to transform them and then later on to uh, translate it to knowledge and also to visualize these results in order to help the uh, fees uh, business operators. Next one, please. And this is a typical example. We have seafoods, we analyze, we store that under different conditions. Uh, and we are using different sensors uh, like video meter, FTIR, electronic nose in parallel with microbiological analysis. We are using different batches in order to uh, include all the variability. Please, next one, please. And um, these are some results. Uh, in the left column, you can see some seafoods that we have analyzed in this uh, uh, project uh, and uh, the developed models uh, that you can see the sensor systems, model algorithms, and the last column give us an idea about the quality of the models, uh, which are uh, in comparison with microbiological analysis that we are using that are uh, um, considered at, uh, very, very, very good results. Next one, please. And uh, actually, Cloud platforms, a data repository should be coupled with appropriate web uh, application in order to assist producers with their expenditures and planning decision. And we are working in this field. Next, uh, next one, please. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, George. Um, we are running slightly behind, so we won't have time for actual um, answering questions live, but the Q and A is quite active. So if anyone wants to pop in there and have a look at the questions and answers or submit their own questions, please do so. We will now move on to the uh, GAIN project where we have uh, three presentations on innovations within that project. And our first presenter will be Edward from Univay. Edward, it's all yours. Good morning, everyone. Um, so for the, the GAIN project, I will first uh, talk to you about the devices for uh, real-time monitoring of animal variables that we tested in, uh, within the project, and in particular, the biomass daily that we tested for in a trout farm. So next, please. So uh, the device itself, uh, the producer of the biomass daily is a uh, Vaki LTD, and the reseller is uh, in Italia is uh, Aquatrade. And so uh, um, the principle of the device, the, the biomass monitoring device, is an infrared sensor, 80 by 80 centimeter frame within the water. And then you've got a, a remote transmission system uh, through a, a sending box, which is connected to the, to the frame, and, uh, and some antennas. These antennas allow to, to connect uh, the device to, to, uh, to a local computer, that's the setup we use in the trout farm in Italy, in North Italy. So uh, the antenna is allowed to connect the device to the to a local computer itself, connected to the to, to internet. So you've got a, a full cloud connection. 
This device, uh, in fact, was uh, was first uh, was designed and uh, and used first uh, in the salmon industry, so in cages. The, the challenge here was to to use it in uh, to trout farming, so no no more in uh, in uh, cages, but in restways. Uh, next, please. The the valuable data that uh, that are delivered by the biomass daily. Um, so we've got uh, uh, daily average weight. So all the, the fishes that uh, go across the frame are, are, are measured. So and, uh, and then you can access uh, uh, a daily average weight. You've got also the detection number, how many fishes were, were, were identified and were measured. You've got also all the individual weights, measurements, and you've got also the, uh, the condition factor. The, the advantage of the, the, the benefits of the, the device is that you've got a human machine interface that is very user friendly. And I think especially for, for the farmer, uh, you've got a, a dashboard with a user and password access uh, uh, available through the, the an internet connection. And, uh, and you've got some graphics uh, already, already done that are very, very pertinent, very useful, but you also have uh, ac access to the raw data, which is more useful for the, for the data scientist. Next, please. So two examples of uh, application uh, of the, the, the data delivered by this device were first uh, the, the dissolved oxygen forecast. So I will present two kinds of uh, data assimilation methods. First, the, the, the dissolved oxygen forecast. We used a simple uh, experimental setup with the two environmental probes for dissolved oxygen at the, and, and temperature at the entrance and the, the, and the exit, the outlet. Um, we used, uh, in this case, the average daily weight of the biomass daily as uh, the best proxy for the, for the uh, average uh, weight of the, of the fish within the raceway. We, we set up a, a, a quite simple a bas, a mass balance model for dissolved oxygen in order to make some, uh, so, some forecast. And, um, and, we, and we realized with the, with the measurements of the dissolved oxygen in the output, we, we, we make some data simulation of the results of the, of the, of the model. Uh, we used the Kalman filter, which is a very known algorithm of uh, data simulation, first used in, in space, but now uh, widely used in many different fields. So the idea is to, 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 to calculate uh, the, the oxygen concentration for the next hour, um, for, the, for the next hour, uh, with using the model, the simple model, but then you've got the, the measurement from the sensor. So you can, uh, you can try with some algorithm to, to correct the forecast, but also uh, some parameters of the models. So the results you have are only forecast of oxygen demand, but also the oxygen concentration. And in the, in the graphics you see on the right, you can see that uh, we, we, we managed to capture both uh, different trends of the, of the oxygen demand, of the respiration rate of the fish. Uh, first, the, the, daily, the daily cycle due to the daily the circadian rhythm of the, the fishes, but also some variations, some more uh, long time variation due to, um, to, to feeding condition, feeding quantity. So it was quite, it's, it's a quite interesting method to, to, to estimate uh, the subduct solution uh, within the raceway. Next, please. And uh, the second application was uh, to, 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 to focus more on the, on, the, on the forecast of the average weight. So um, as an experimental setup, this time we used um, the, the amount of feed supply, again, the temperature. And uh, we used another, another kind of uh, data simulation algorithm, the particle filter. And uh, we tried to, to, to build some um, so, some better estimates of the of the growth of the of the of the fishes, and uh, to do so, use a bioenergetic growth model, and using the data measured this time by the biomass daily, we try to to correct the the estimation of the of the growth uh, delivered by the this bioenergetic growth model. So the results, as you can see on the on the right, is uh, uh, an average weight <coughs> for the for all the fishes uh, present in the cage. That is uh, corrected when you've got uh, some measurements that are very far from uh, from your prediction. 
And uh, so this is very, very interesting because you, you, you manage to combine the model and the observation, which is the, the, the aim and the, and, the, and the use of the, of the data simulation algorithm. And um, but we, for the moment, we only focused on the, on the average weight and we will now, we, we will be doing it now, focus on the, we try to set up a population model to, to better understand the, the dispersion within the population and so to better use the, the data delivered by the, by the monitoring uh, device. And that's it for me. Many, thank you very much. I give the floor to, to Joao. Uh, hi there, uh, my name is uh, Jean Ferreira. Can someone confirm you can hear me fine? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. So I'm just going to show you a very quick uh, set of slides on uh, the decentralized uh, data processing and information extraction. Uh, this is a um, next slide, please. Uh, this is um, just a, a conceptual framework of, of what we're talking about. So going from the left uh, downwards, you can see a different uh, uh, set of species that we are considering. These are typically farmed uh, in a, a monospecific context. Um, there are a range of environmental drivers that can uh, be relevant to, to these. And in particular, when it comes to shellfish, um, parameters such, a such as chlorophyll become relevant. You can see those on the, on the, the examples of those on the right-hand side as I'm going through this, um, you, you, we need to deal with response data and model results. So this is a very important um, combination that you have both the, the data coming out of the sensors, which is the easier bit, and then the response variables coming out of the animals themselves. So you can link up the two. And of course, farm operators have uh, a lot of intervention in this. Uh, this is routed through a data hub, or which can be just a, a single point or can be various points. And uh, that, in the context of GAIN, is being done by IBM, and that's going to be talked about next. Um, but also, it can uh, then be used to distribute services uh, in, uh, in a broader range. And these can include uh, aspects such as um, models, that deal with the growth and the environmental performance of the animals that we're um, interested in. Uh, next slide. I'm going to give you just an example of a couple of these uh, individual models. So Longline has got uh, quite some experience doing this, both at the individual and at the population level. This is a model called AquaShell. Uh, what you see here is um, uh, some uh, uh, curves for growth for blue mussel in um, a place called Dundrum Bay near Belfast. This is from one of our partners called AFPI. And the kinds of outputs that we get from these models, you can see in the spreadsheets uh, window on the right there. So net biomass production, and then uh, how much water is, is being filtered through and a number of other uh, aspects which are important from a sustainability point of view, and therefore in terms of uh, eco-intensification. Next, uh, the next example is, is for fish. It's the same kind of model. Uh, the, this model is called Aquafish. And we, we do this for salmon and for trout and for bass and bream, but basically for all the major species that are cultivated. And uh, you can see, this is another way of presenting those results, the mass balance for the animal after a, a culture cycle. So this gives us uh, the capacity to uh, be able to deal with how much food is ingested, uh, how much is, is lost, uh, and it enables us to do things like calculate the FCR of the, of the fish and the number of uh, lost terms as well. Next, these are, uh, at the moment, this is at design stage, this is a, a platform called AquaSense, and uh, the, the concept behind this is that we are uh, parameterizing the, the inputs, the drivers uh, for, the, for the culture, and then we are tapping into the hub, which, as I said, is currently maintained by IBM, to draw out the, um, uh, the environmental drivers that, that condition the growth of the animal. And then we can uh, run these individual models, but this time we're running them on a, on, a, on a web platform. Next. And these are the kinds of results that we're getting for individual animals, um, which mirror what I just showed you uh, in terms of the, of the console-based uh, apps that, that uh, uh, simulated shellfish and finfish. 
the idea is that we are going to uh, within gain scale this up to populations in other words to the number of fish in a in a cage or then scale that up to a farm likewise shellfish on long lines or on trestles um, and uh, so, so the, the intent of this obviously is to provide an easy way for farmers to be able to predict uh, which way their um, uh, culture will develop and how uh, the uh, how that matches what they actually observe and give give them a far better handle in terms of precision on on the uh, on the cultivation. So next slide. This is my final slide, and I just wanted to uh, again go into the conceptual part and give you some thoughts on what I think are key requirements for precision aquaculture. Obviously, the first one is that you have a deployment of sensors that can supply the environmental data. I've included disease in there, which is something that's more difficult to do, but very very important, particularly from the point of view of risk and insurance. Sada spoke about insurance right at the beginning of this session, um, but also the detection of measurable response metrics from cultivated species. And some of those can be uh, on a reporting basis from farmers, not necessarily sensed. They don't necessarily need to be at exactly the same frequency as we're able to do this with digital sensors for the input data. And of course, the coupling and interpretation of these input and response data are the key to get, uh, I would say, quasi or real time information on the cultivation process. Um, and what you need to get industry uptake, this is a key aspect in my view, is platforms where uh, stakeholders can, can easily access uh, this material and understand it and make use of it. Thank you very much. Hi all. So um, uh, my name is Fergal O'Donoghue. I'm with um, IBM Research in Dublin. And what I want to talk about is follow on from uh, Shell's talk is uh, go a little bit more deeper into the um, uh, the gain data service that we're developing and uh, working on. And there are three things really that I want to talk about here. Uh, there's one that data integration. So that's from sensors and from um, external services, sources of data, etc. There's the modeling and um, uh, machine learning side of things. And then there's the uh, dissemination and uh, communication of these to the end user um, perspective. So as um, I think as Yao communicated very, very effectively there, uh, one of the main um, aspects of aquaculture farms is the complexity, the heterogeneity um, across sites, across geographies, across species, et cetera. So from a precision aquaculture perspective, uh, what is demanded really is the ability to integrate data from multiple different sources, the ability to process, curate, understand, contextualize these data, and the ability to, I guess, reduce the dimensionality of these data or to make these data understandable for um, end users. Uh, so from that perspective, there are two main components that we looked at from a machine learning perspective. Uh, how much of it can we automate? So how much of the uh, data curation, data integration, data cleaning, uh, data handling, and uh, forecasting or machine learning and prediction, how much of that can we automate? And how much of that is bespoke or requires a more sophisticated analysis that considers the data science and the domain expert perspective, because I think that is an important point that is um, sometimes missed in, in data science projects. Uh, the data alone is generally not sufficient. It generally requires uh, quite detailed uh, domain knowledge and domain expertise, which is why I think um, programs like today are excellent in bringing together uh, people from uh, many different fields, many different expertise, et cetera, to um, a guide and inform on the specific aspects. Uh, so what we looked at from a uh, machine learning perspective here was the data integration from the sensors, data integration from external sources. So some of those were uh, Copernicus, Emodnet, um, regional models such as the Norcus model in Norway. Uh, we uh, also leverage um, weather data, et cetera, from um, IBM weather operations data. Uh, the curation and um, processing of those and the handling of time series data in an auto way, in an auto machine learning perspective. So can we uh, simply look at the data integration and cleansing there to allow for 
real-time forecasting of um, time series sensor data so that primarily that is um, environmental data and to move that from data observation to forecast so to move that from uh, real time to forecast and finally then we looked at um, the dissemination of that or the um, extension of that with bespoke machine learning um, perspectives so I'm conscious of time here so what I'll do is I'll very briefly uh, run through two aspects of this uh, so this um, what I'm showing here is an example of our uh, model management system for the time series forecasting systems so in effect, what we are doing here, so this is one of the sites that we have in GAIN, which is um, uh, the Dalhousie site in uh, Canada. Uh, so what we have here is a variety of different uh, sensors that are being collected at the site and that allows, so, and that have been uh, contextualized with some standard information on uh, coordinates, uh, co geographical coordinates, coordinates relative to the uh, site and coordinates relative to the cage. So that allows us to uh, more easily process the data from machine learning perspective in terms of each cage can have its um, uh, bespoke uh, machine learning model uh, forecasting system. And that is, um, it, that is compartmentalized within the cage and within the farm to allow for, um, uh, to allow for analysis against different farms, et cetera. So we can uh, look at different uh, we can look at different visualizations of the time series forecasting perspectives, etc. Uh, so this gives us one overview into um, uh, the machine learning forecast from the relatively from the more automated side of uh, machine learning developments. So these are looking primarily at time series forecasting of environmental conditions. Uh, for other more um, detailed analysis, investigations, etc. We uh, looked at a more um, programmatic capabilities and we use quite heavily Watson Studio for this, which, um, which allows us to uh, interrogate the data uh, programmatically. So we can quite easily uh, work in local notebook, work in a, um, a Watson Studio notebook online, it allows us to effectively and easily collaborate with external partners and where we have found that extremely beneficial is uh, collaborating on the data science plus X or the data science plus domain expertise uh, side of things. So it allows us to easily develop the machine learning side of things that are then um, that are then extended with uh, the bespoke analysis. So I'm kind of time here. So what I'll do is very quickly run through just exactly what we're looking at here. So this just a very quick overview of the different sites. Uh, this is uh, pulling different data sets from our gain service based on uh, the signal and based on our uh, ontology of sensors, et cetera. So it allows us to easily pull that data, uh, combine them, look at some basic visualization analysis, and then finally to um, deploy within a more bespoke machine learning model perspective where uh, we develop our auto AI pipeline here and our selection of machine learning models such as um, XGBoost, Random Forest, K-Nearest Neighbor, et cetera, uh, to train that and then to deploy um, easily and rapidly and get a uh, machine learning model uh, deployed that we can collaborate with our partners on, that we can um, iterate on and um, uh, fine tune iteratively in that manner. And uh, that's pretty much everything I want to talk about. So, um, Neil, I'll pass it back to you. Thanks, Fergal. Thank you very much. I don't think I've seen so much math since my leave insert. Um, <laughs> thank you to all presenters there from the GAIN project and to everybody for submitting questions through the Q&A. It's quite active and there's a lot of questions coming in and being answered. So I would uh, recommend people to go in there and have a look. We will now move on for the final bit of this session to the efficiency project, where we will have a couple of presentations on innovations in monitoring fish feeding behavior and the environment. And I will move you over to our first presenter, which will be Frank.
Hello, I hope you, you can see my screen. Yeah, um, everything is good. Uh, so so I, I will start presenting the technological developments in the efficiency project. Uh, I'm Frank Legal from AGM, and I will present two concepts that we have in the project, one named IBOS and the other one being uh, Fish Talk to Me. Um, what are the needs again? Okay, we have been speaking a lot of, about that since the morning, but in efficiency, we are really focusing on the feeding process and what we want is to uh, reduce the input cost uh, in the aquaculture domain. We want to decrease waste and reduce uh, obviously our uh, environmental footprint. And uh, also, of course, to, to increase fish production quality and quantity. And for that, we need uh, data, uh, uh, and some rules and algorithms to, to, to provide uh, recommendations. Data, again, we've been discussing a lot, but it comes from many places. It's sensors, obviously, it comes from the fish themselves, from the farmers, uh, and it's not only about sensory data, but it's we have to cover the, the whole uh, life cycle and also think about uh, multi um, multi stakeholders, so multiple companies involved in, in, in the domain. Uh, and when we are able to match these data, then we have to uh, apply some rules, some algorithms on that, uh, but not neglecting the, uh, the human, the, the, the gut feeling, you know, the, the expert knowledge that is quite important in, in, in that domain, and to be able to include that in the, um, through some algorithms into the system. So what we, we, we do uh, in efficiency, we develop the IBOS concept, which is uh, the cloud as well, which is able to connect the, the data producers, uh, the data consumers, and uh, the data processors. And these, we, we, we will find all the data producers that I was mentioning. And for that, because it's multi-stakeholders, it's not only one company providing one solution, we need interoperable interfaces, which are open, extensible, and, and secured. And for that, in the project, we are using some standards from the ETSI, which is the European Standardization Institute for Telecom, as well as the Fireware ecosystem, which provides some open source components for, for that. And an example of uh, deployment we, we, we have uh, running, we have the IBOS cloud, which is in the middle, which is connecting uh, the, the, the systems, open cage or, uh, or recirculating RAS systems. We are obviously connecting to the feeders because that's what we want to pilot at the end um, and um, provide some dashboard to the farmers. And what we do is that we have several partners, Biocenter, Oxyguards, they have their own systems, they have their own clouds, which are deployed on the farm. But we are able to connect to these systems and uh, to exchange data together. And also, as data processor, what we, we connect here is um, with digital twin paradigm. So we have a virtual representation of, of the fish. And using this digital twin, we are able to uh, consume real-time data from the cloud, from the different systems, from the different operator on site, and to provide uh, feedback to the system so at the end to, to pilot the, the, the feeders. Uh, quickly, because we will have other presentation on virtual twin later on uh, today, um, we are working on two main experiments, uh, CKH, um, where we focus on European CBAS, um, and we have a number of sensors for camera, hydroacoustic, water quality, and in a, in the RAS systems where we, we are focusing now on the truth, um, and where we, we are developing these, um, these digital twins and seeing okay what are the different stage uh, for, for for the for the for the fishes uh, before uh, feeding, after, during, and so on, and, and to be able through the fish took to me um, models to identify where, in which stage are the fishes, so to adapt adequately the, the, the feeding uh, process. Uh, we, we have um, the, uh, uh, the, the whole system which is, uh, which is uh, running today. So you, you can see the, the dashboard is monitoring because it's not only providing interfaces to the aquaculture. That's not our purpose. We have companies doing that very well. Here on the back end, we are collecting data to connect the feeders, so it's kind of invisible things. But still, we are connecting sensors. You can see here all issues, so which are reported by the system that okay, some data is missing because on-site connection is missing. Here we see okay, there is 
one uh, calibration which is needed on one sensor so intervention on site is, is to be planned and, and there are several other things uh, we, we have the real-time cameras for, for the for, for the systems and also all weather forecast or weather uh, water quality forecast that we we can gather from different sources as well and which are used by the different algorithms to, 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 to plan the, the feeding process. Um, so that's it for, for my presentation, quite fast, but I hope we'll have some, some time for questions afterward. And now I will leave the, the floor to, uh, to Joseph from Aquabiotech, who will present the, the Smart RAS um, system, which is building on the IBOS. Joseph, the floor is yours. Thank you, Frank. Good morning, everyone. So, uh, I'm Joseph DePrisco, working here at the Aquabiotech Group in Malta. I'm just going to talk a bit more about our efficiency and the trials we've been running here. So, our efficiency, one of the overarching themes is the use of artificial intelligence, big data, and cloud computing to yield better understanding of aquaculture systems and then use this understanding to make better decisions, particularly in terms of feeding. So next slide, please, Frank. We've been using automatic feeding robots here. Um, and obviously RAS, we were actually a recirculating, recirculating aquaculture facility. And RAS is ideally suited to this kind of precision aquaculture because you can exercise plenty of control over the systems, monitoring, etc. So for the feeding, we use uh, automated feeding robots where you can program the exact time and the amount of feed which is added, which is very useful for this kind of experimentation. And then for the estimation of feed intake, we've been using an X-ray radiography uh, technique uh, using a labeled diet, which basically incorporates X-ray opaque <coughs> Valentini beads. And we obviously, if we're looking at the entire feeding thing as a whole, then it's how the feeding connects to things like the water quality. So if you could move on to the next slide, please, Frank. This is an OxyGuard commander monitoring system. This gives real-time information about the conditions in the fish tanks, in the sun, and in the system as a whole. Um, and as has been mentioned previously in the webinar, a lot of these data are generally only used to ensure that the water quality parameters stay within certain limits and thresholds to ensure that no harm is incurred to the fish. But part of our efficiency in the precision aquaculture approach in general is to use these data and unlock their potential to actually teach us more about what's going on both environmentally and physiologically in the systems. Uh, so if you can move on to the next slide, please. Brian. This is the Cobalia dashboard. Uh, it's kind of similar to what Frank just showed now, but that was in the IBOS cloud. So this is kind of one of the links, if you like, between the two. And this is where data is automatically pushed from the monitoring system to the Cobalia dashboard here. And uh, I mean, Cobalia is not only like a kind of water quality dashboard, it can also be used for uh, a variety of production and management operations as well. Uh, and then if you could go to the next slide, please, Frank. So digital assistance, here we've got uh, overhead cameras mounted above the RAS tanks. And as you can see here, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this kind of image. We're using uh, machine learning algorithms to try to detect and track fish in tanks in real time using machine vision. And if you could please take it to the next slide, Frank. So this is quite similar to what Fergal just showed before. We've been using the scikit-learn and uh, Python to do k-means clustering to begin with, to try and characterize behavior which might be indicative of, for example, hunger and satiation in fish. And one of the main things that machine vision can actually do is it can look at things on a much higher resolution than a human eye can. Um, so if we watch the videos, we might see certain things, but the computer can see it in a lot more detail. And what we've been looking at is the way that fish cluster, for example, when they're very hungry, and then the way that they cluster when they're satiated. And obviously these algorithms need to be taught. So the requirement is a lot of data, which is an ongoing process, the collection of that data. And then the next steps will be to try and look at how 
these kind of methods may be applied to actually knowing when to maybe start and stop feeding fish and allow operators and users to make better decisions about feeding in terms of fish welfare and growth and also its effect on the water quality as well. So thank you for your attention and I'm going to hand the floor back. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this brings to a close this session and we actually have some time. So we will take uh, a couple of questions before our next break. And if anyone has any questions, please submit them in the Q&A. Or if you're really brave, you can ask us live, turn on your camera. Uh, we have one already in the um, Q&A question. This one is directed, I believe, to Joseph. And the person asking is interested to know how fish are affected by using x-ray on those live fish. Uh, that, that, that's a good question. Uh, and there was certainly something that we looked into quite rigorously before. Obviously there was quite a bit of method validation beforehand. And it seems that, you know, they, they return to a kind of normal feeding behavior within 12 hours of the process. They're anesthetized and x-rayed as quickly as possible. And it does seem to be like a kind of non-destructive sampling method that works at a reasonable level of accuracy and incurs what you might call a minimum level of harm to the fish. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have any more questions from our 82 participants? Okay. Okay, we have uh, nothing more coming in at the moment. I guess there's a lot of information being shared at the last hour or so. Um, what we're going to do now is take a break for uh, just over 10 minutes. Uh, we will resume on the hour and we will focus in the next session on the user experience. So we will hear some presentations from each of the projects on some of the practical applications of, of the technology developments that we have been hearing about from all our presenters. So thank you very much so far. And uh, we will meet back in 12 minutes. And please, if you think of any more questions, please uh, submit them into the Q&A. Thank you.